primate's body plan is one that's both highly adaptable and versatile, and today, and throughout the fossil record, has been incredibly successful, with humans being a result of said diversification. It's interesting to note then that said body plan, like practically all in nature, is not an entirely unique one, and one example from far before our time, back in the Permian period, shows just how diverse life once was, and that patterns of evolution and adaptation often than not converge when environmental conditions are met. Arboreal vertebrates today, animals that spend a great deal of time in trees, are a prime component of terrestrial environments, with several distinct lineages of reptiles, including birds, and several lineages of synapsids, including mammals, have repeatedly filled in these niches. Arboreal niches are particularly important not only in regards to access to unique food resources, but also allows for protection against large ground-dwelling predators which are generally not able to reach said animals. One fascinating example comes in the form of a peculiar animal known as Suminia, a vaguely monkey-like animal described in 1994 that was a synapsid, aka a stem mammal that falls outside the crown group of what we know as mammalia, and is more specifically an anomodont, a group of animals that as will be discussed, are quite peculiar. Suminia is known from the late Permian period around 260 million years ago from what is now Russia, and was itself a very small genus when compared with their relatives with them being around 50 centimetres long, and had a range of anatomical features that, as will be explained, showcase a great aptitude for arboreal locomotion. Said aptitude for living in said environments is made further noticeable by them being the first known example from the fossil record of a vertebrates being adapted to an arboreal lifestyle as Saminia evidently was, and therefore, their discovery and description has left a significant mark when it comes to the evolutionary developments and history of arboreal lifestyles. Anomodontia, the suborder to which Suminia belongs, were a diverse and successful group, most notably encompassing the Dicynodonts, the largest subclade in the suborder, which dominated terrestrial ecosystems as the main herbivores in the later stages of the Paleozoic and the early stages of the Mesozoic, diversifying into over 70 genera and well over 100 species. Lystrosaurus, the most well-known taxon, even accounting for as many as 95% of the total individual animals in some fossil beds after the end Permian extinction. More basal, non dicynodont anomodonts are however less well known overall and comprise only around 10 genera with 11 species, a majority of which are very fragmentary, with skull fragments usually being the sole remains known, aside from scant fragments of other miscellaneous bones. Suminia is the youngest known non dicynodont anomodont in their group, with them alongside Osteria and Ulamica making up the group known as the Venucavoidia, animals that are known to have been derived from an ancestor that dispersed from Gondwana and into Euro-America. Their lack of remains and initial stages of evolution are therefore not all that well known, and that continues to be the case until 2009, when a wealth of newly described, incredibly well-preserved and articulated specimens of Suminia were studied and described by Georg Frobich and Robert Reist. Already known of from well-preserved skulls, the remains of more than a dozen animals were excavated at the Kotelnik locality, and helped us to better understand the post cranial anatomy, with the new material comprising an ontogenetic span ranging from nearly sub adult animals having femur lengths of around 59.2mm to adults having femur lengths of around 80mm. This in turn provides one of the most complete pictures of the anatomy of a Paleozoic synapsid, not just because of the number of individuals present, but also in how well preserved, complete, and articulated they are, with the majority of the skeletons being preserved on a single block with the preservation of their bones suggesting a rapid burial caused by some sort of catastrophic event, likely a flood of some sort, as some of the disarticulated remains appear to show that some movement occurs, along with the fact that they show no sign of scavenging or weathering. Such high levels of preservation meant that a lot more could be understood about them and their habits, with their anatomy showcasing great aptitudes for an arboreal habitat. They have a large list of adaptations for this, with them having very long fingers and large hands when compared to the rest of their arms, their finger proportions, the possession of a divergent first digit, as well as a potentially prehensile tail. To start off, both of their fore and tie limbs are elongate, with both the manus and pes composing of up to 40% of the length of the limbs, respectively, with the most striking feature regarding their hands and feet, and possibly in the entire skeleton being the extreme elongation of the penultimate phalanges, with Suminia retaining the ancestral phalangeal formula of amniotes, that's being 23452 in the manus, and 23454 4 in the pairs, representing an evolutionary stage in the phylogenetic reduction towards the more typical mammalian phalangeal formula in therapsis to what we're familiar with. Morphometric evidence for an arboreal lifestyle is also supported by comparisons with other tetrapods known to be arboreal, 
ranging from mammals to lizards to birds. By investigating the proportions and the manners of both extinct synapsids and various clades of extant tetrapods in a comparative analysis, the results in general strongly supported a trend in arboreal tetrapods towards a more increased phalangeal index. The combined length of both the proximal and penultimate phalanges as a percentage of their respective mesoposial element. What would be seen in a typical terrestrial tetrapod would be a long mesoposium and short phalanges, whereas a typical arboreal tetrapod would have the opposite condition, with the latter case being found in Suminia and appears to correlate closely with clinging behaviour. Their degree of climbing would have also been assisted in a way of some manner of opposable thumb, evidenced by them having an enlarged carpal and tarsal one, suggesting a divergent first digits, the first of its kinds known in the fossil record. Their tail and back anatomy was also well specialised for arboreal locomotion, as they had an expanded anterior region as well as a general lack of fusion in their sacral region, which would have led to increased flexibility alongside their vertebrae, ribs and ilium also being generally unfused. In addition, the tail, as well as being expanded in size, is also characterised by pronounced neural arches and spines, alongside prominent transverse processes that are fused to their laterally protruding caudal ribs, something which is also seen in animals that are known to have at least some prehensile abilities in their tails, allowing them to better manoeuvre through dense foliage, as well as for balance. These traits all show that Suminia independently evolved grasping and clinging abilities for an arboreal setting well before the evolution of these characteristics in other tetrapods, being around 20 million years older than the next known appearance, being that of the Triassic trypanosaurs, and shows just how far back the continual succession into arboreal habitats amongst tetrapods began and diversified. The rest of their skeleton is also quite intriguing, as they are one of the few synapses known to have retained Australia. That's while being a more basal condition, were reduced in both number and robustness in Saminia, with them consisting of short, needle-like elements that were likely arranged in a single row per trunk segment. This apparent reduction and their eventual loss in more derived therapsids suggests a diminished respiratory and structural support function for them, which is how they function in the animals that do have them, with said reduction possibly being related to the development of the muscular diaphragm. Now that we know of their arboreal lifestyle and general anatomy, just what exactly were they doing up in the trees, and what were they feeding on? To gain a better understanding of this, the cranial anatomy was described in detail, which revealed that they had a highly specialised masticatory apparatus, that is the teeth, jaws and muscles used for chewing, and was quite aberrant in their dentition as well, having implications for changes in their ecosystems in exploiting new food sources. Suminia have quite robust dentition, with animals having large, leaf-shaped teeth, as well as a masticatory architecture, which was similar to that of the related Dicynodonts, indicating Saminia was also adapted to herbivory, and that they were highly specialised for it as well. Evidence for this comes in the form of the oval pattern of tooth shape and wear, with them having enlarged anterior incisiform teeth that match closely with extant herbivorous reptiles like spiny-tailed lizards, which use them in order to detach plant portions for ingestion, with their upper and lower posterior tooth rows having wave facets that are distinct and evidently derived from tooth-to-tooth -tooth contact rather than tooth-to-food wear. The excellent preservation of the skulls we have allows it to be possible to infer the pattern of tooth occlusion during the power stroke of chewing, the first such reconstruction to be done for a Paleozoic tetrapod, in Saminia, the shape of the jaw joints and the high-angled wear facets indicates that the jaw movements during the power stroke was constrained to the sagittal plane, presence of roughly parallel striations over the entire surface of the wear facets, indicating that food particles were reduced with a precise, shearing stroke as opposed to crushing, which would have allowed them to better able slice through and process tougher plant materials. Said processing is similar to the more derived Dicynodonts, meaning that this sliding jaw articulation may well have originated before them, and that this was a basal condition to Animodontia. Such dentition has evolved convergently in at least five distinct lineages, being Iguanid lizards, Piraeosaurs, Caesids, Synapsids, and Ornithischian and Prosauropon dinosaurs, with this enabling them to increase their digestion rates by allowing them to reduce food sizes. And in the case of animodonts like Saminia, said developments in being able to process tougher plant foods was critical to their diversification and survival on the onsets of more modern terrestrial ecosystems. There has been an observable link between the time land-dwelling herbivores like Saminia began to more efficiently process the foods, and the large increase in animal diversity that follows, with a typical high percentage of herbivores supporting a much smaller percentage of top predators. The locality where Saminia was found has yielded a very rich assemblage of vertebrates, and hence is a prime example of a late Permian terrestrial community, with excavations spanning over two decades yielding more than 350 articulated and partially articulated skeletons.
It's been found that this representative fauna is dominated heavily by herbivorous animals, around 93% of which being so. A small number of insectivores, 4%, with small and large carnivores at 9 and 4% respectively. Although their stomach contents have not yet been recovered, the sediments that they are found in have yielded a large amount of coprolites with extensive leaf fragments, with a size of less than 10 millimetres, being consistent with them belonging to Saminia. Alongside this, the presence of the in situ preserved roots indicates the presence of large, tree-like plants that exceeded 2.5 metres in height, much taller than any contemporary ground-dwelling animals. While it is true that an arboreal lifestyle would have kept them more safe from predation, the hypothesis that it was in fact competition on the grounds with other herbivores that led them to attempt the exploitation of other, yet untapped niches, is a big factor in how they turned out. This in turn appears to be the first known example of food partitioning between smaller arboreal and larger terrestrial herbivores after the establishment of the modern trophic structure, with large numbers of primary consumers supporting a small percentage of predators. Their similarity to primates is attempting parallel to make, given so, and as such, speculation by those intrigued by speculative evolution have wondered about whether or not they could have gone down a familiar path to what we went down, only way back in the Permian 250 million years ago, if the great dying didn't occur. A humanoid, Semini descendant, is indeed an interesting one, although said comparison does have some flaws, if it's worse to happen. Primates and the trajectory of our evolution was very much products of Cenozoic forests, with high-calorie fruits and softer leaves being the main food sources necessary to fuel larger brains, something that was lacking in the case of Suminia. As well as this, there are many other animals like tree kangaroos, possums and lemurs that are similarly adapted in a similar manner to Suminia, and do not have similar EQ, encephalization quotient levels to do with the relative brain size when compares to more derived primates. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.